Hello, everybody. I'm Jamie. And I'm John. And this is the Elvis Archival Preservation Society. If you're a big Elvis fan like us, this is your society, our society, the EAP Society. Uh, if you would like to get in on the ground floor of the EAP Society, want to become a member of the EAP Society, go to EAPsociety.com, click on Become a Member. Members get early videos, ad-free videos, extra content, extended content, exclusive content, all kinds of fun stuff. Uh, but don't forget, like, share, comment, subscribe on this video and help us grow the channel. We would really appreciate that. Today we are looking at another one of the Elvis specials, this time from 1968. Now, for context, you might be thinking, wow, they're going to talk about the 68 special? What are they going to talk about? No. Yeah, these uh, Elvis monthly annuals were actually released like in the later part of the year prior to the year that's on the cover. So like it, let's in say the fourth quarter of 67, the fans would get the 68 annual. Okay. So it would kind of be a, you know, a summation of what had happened in the prior year and maybe a little thoughts about what they hoped moving forward. Yeah. And it's especially interesting here because of what we know happens in right. 1968. And it's, this is probably one of the more fascinating encapsulations of fan sentiment and opinion. Exactly. Yeah. Because this is sort of at the end of the Hollywood era pre comeback. Yeah. Elvis had just gotten married. He was getting tired of Hollywood. The, it was time for a change. Yeah. And some of that sentiment, as you will see, is very much present in this uh, annual. So it's neat to kind of see what the fans were thinking right as we were coming to like the clam bake. Yeah. The end of the, the long run of movies that Elvis had made in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So we're going to show you. I, I happen to love that shot from uh, Spin Out. Yeah. Then there's another shot from Spin Out on the back. Both great pictures. Oh, yeah. So we're just Very gonna, colorful. It, very colorful. Yep. So we're going to just do a quick look-see before we continue. So. A word from the editor. Picture of Elvis and Priscilla. <laughs> Elvis was my inspiration. This is a guy who played basketball for Kansas talking about how much he likes Elvis. That's awesome. Very cool. An interview. This is uh, Mrs. Hand, who I guess was Albert Hand's wife, and she's talking about the time she got to meet Elvis. That's very cool. Mm-hmm. And you can definitely see that uh, Spin Out was a big deal. Oh, yeah. For better or for worse. Some older pictures from Love Me Tender. Mm -hmm. Ah, the growing list of singles and EPs available. <laughs> Easy come, easy go. Yep. And interesting thing, go ahead and tell the folks where else they would find that car. Yes, that car that you see Elvis driving there was purchased uh, by the people who are producing the 1966 TV show Batman. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was used in the second season of that show as the Joker Mobile. Yeah. And as crazy as the colors were for that car in Easy Come, Easy Go, they really would, didn't need to change much. No, they just added Joker's face I in a couple of places. I love that shot. Great shot. We have lots of uh, fan poetry and fan fiction in these. That's beautiful. And we might come back to it later times. We might come back to more of the... Uh, I mean, we're kind of scattering what we're talking about here. Like, we're not just doing all of the specials all in one shot even though we are recording them that way. Right. Um, but uh, we'll, we might come back to other things like some of the fan fiction because I, I, I find that stuff endlessly fascinating. A vision of the future. That's one we're definitely going to have to dive into. Oh, big time. Pictures from Frankie and Johnny. Oh, man, 66 was a busy year for Elvis. It was a very busy year. The Paradise Hawaiian style. 
Let's take a further look at Graceland. Now, this is an interesting article, and we are going to get to this one, but maybe not in this episode. Yeah. And it is by a fan that got to visit Graceland in the mid-60s, and they describe in detail what it looked like, including the upstairs. Wow. Yeah. That is awesome. Whoop, there we go. Oh, sorry. Easy come, easy go. I bumped the uh, microphone stand again. Sorry. Yeah, it's, Elvis it's, playing the Fender bass. Yeah. Who's he think he is? Jerry Schiff. <laughs> That's just an old hound dog. <laughs> <laughs> you ain't nothing but a. <laughs> Step back, hound dog, of which you ain't nothing but a. <laughs> uh, I can't remember what that's from. Let me know in the comments if you remember. I can't remember offhand. I think it's, was it, was it Phil Silvers or? Uh, I can't remember. Very cool. This is one fan's uh, description of their fan experience. Nice picture of Elvis playing a Burns guitar, which I just yeah. realized was a British guitar. I like the I like the shot. That's uh, that's like that thing from uh, spin out that. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they have a write up about the history of Elvis at the Louisiana Hayride, which is pretty cool. Ooh. Or Louisiana, if you want to say it the proper non-Southern way. There we go. Another really cool shot. On the set of Easy Come, Easy Go. Yep. There we go. And this, uh, a black mark for Roustabout, is a fan's angry rebuttal to another fan who had had some nasty words for the album Roustabout. I love it. The full Elvis song list. <laughs> it would be interesting to look at um, some of those, some of the songs and see like if they were just going with like official releases, if they went with any rumored stuff. Oh, yeah. So we'll have to, we'll, we'll, we'll look and if there's anything that's really special or different then we'll. Uh, then we'll we'll read it, but uh, if not, then mm -hmm. it's fascinating to see some of these things in their contemporary context. Exactly. Yeah. There's Toby Quimper. Yep. And this is a little thing of uh, photos of Elvis on the set, behind the scenes. Here is Elvis talking with Norman Taurog while making GI Blues. Mm -hmm. Elvis and the Colonel. <laughs> and more people who I'm not as familiar with. Yeah. It's especially hard to see them in the preview window. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It, our preview window is a little on the tiny side. There we go. It's another spin out shot. Yeah. From that same party scene. The hard luck scene from Frankie and Johnny. Blue Hawaii and Elvis, and I believe the dog's name is Peanut. <laughs> and there we go. There we go. Whew. It's, it's a workout for the old arm. You wouldn't think it would be because it's not that heavy, but then after you after you hold it in one place and trying to like be above this thing so what do we want to take when i bump into this a little bit do we want to take a quick break before we dive into this yes thing? we do we will talk about this elvis 19 elvis special 1968 after these messages Welcome back to the EAP Society, everybody. We are looking at the Elvis special 1968, and now we're going to look at a couple of the articles. Do you, do you want to start this off? I, I can, the, if you'd like. Yeah, let's start start us off with this one. This looks right. really interesting. I'm looking forward to seeing what Miss Hand has to say about yeah. meeting Elvis. VG chats to Mrs. Hand about her meetings with Elvis. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to find a place to hold this thing. <laughs> Just, you know. You milk this thing long enough. Anyway, uh, 
I asked Mrs. Hand about her first meeting with Elvis, and this is what she told me. Well, it was when he was filming Kid Galhad, and at the time uh, when we wanted to see him, he was filming at the top of the mountain uh, just outside California. It was boiling hot, well over 90 degrees down in the valley, and we went up this mountain wearing just summer clothes. When we got to the top, though, it was snowing and freezing cold, and we had no coat or anything. Still, the fact that we were going to see Elvis made me warm from the inside, even though it was minus 10 degrees up there. <laughs> the mountain was several thousand feet high, so you could have thought thought we'd had got more sense than to expect it to be the same temperature in the valley. It was me who, who saw Elvis first. I nudged Albert and said, look, he's there. Albert's first ambition was to meet Elvis, and that was fulfilled then. I was overwhelmed when I saw him. I must admit that before I met Elvis, I always thought he was a bit sullen. I don't know why. It was just an impression I got. But after seeing him, I can honestly say that he is the most handsome man I have ever met. He has a pearly white complexion, not in the least bit olive or sallow, as many photographs seem to make him look. He has bright blue eyes, really dark blue, not brown as most people think, and jet black hair. Although he has got the, altogether, he has got the, in all caps, perfect face. I don't think he is very photogenic, because I've never seen a photograph that makes him look as handsome as he really is. <laughs> I don't know if that's what photogenic means. All right. Anyway, when Elvis saw that we hadn't come prepared for the freezing conditions, he was very concerned. He kept asking if I was warm enough. Of course, I said, yes, really. I was frozen to the ground. He kept fetching us cups of coffee and asking if I wanted to borrow a coat. He had come fully equipped for the fur coat, boots, gloves, scarf, etc., because he knew what it would be like. However, the fact that it was cold didn't stop us enjoying all of it. Um, now, about the second time you saw him, I asked. The second time I saw Elvis was when he was at the film studios. He was very interested in hearing all about Derbyshire in England, and he just couldn't believe that some of the houses were joined together, because in his part of America, all the houses are detached and set in their own grounds. He seemed intrigued when Albert told him all about his father having been a coal miner. He had never heard about all, all about that before. It was whilst we were in these studios that we met Sam Katzman, the director of quite a few of Elvis's movies. Uh, he said he had never known anyone like Elvis to work with. He is never late for sessions, never annoys him or rouses his temper, and he listens to anyone's advice even if they know less about it than he does. He is well-mannered <laughs> and considerate and is always anxious to do his very best when filming. But then I asked Mrs. Hand for her impressions of the Colonel, Tom Parker. Well, he's a very jovial and happy man, not at all the big bad wolf he's made out to be. We have met him twice. Each time we have been to his nightclub, and the second time he treated us to dinner. He also took us round the new RCA recording studios in Hollywood, which was very interesting. As well as meeting Colonel Tom Parker, Mrs. Hand also met Tom Diskin, who is in charge of all the office duties and is the Colonel's second in command. They were both very impressed with the fan club badges that they were presented with, and both of them had asked Mrs. Hand to pin it on for them. The question that most of you will probably be wanting answered is, did Mrs. Hand see any of Elvis's girlfriends? Well, they did meet Anita Wood, whom everyone thought would eventually marry Elvis, but she herself is now happily married, and Elvis never said anything about uh, this side of his personal life. She thought it best not to pry. Oh, okay. and as Elvis never said. She I think that's it. the it. That's yeah. the, that, that, that's the end of it. That's really cool. Yeah, that's really kind of an interesting look at uh, a little visit with Elvis on the set of Kid Galahad. Yeah. I tell you, um, it speaks to the dedication of Elvis fans that... They went through the heat and the snow just to meet the man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it. Yeah. Now, that, that's the shorter article? Yeah. The, okay, cool. Very, very cool. Well, I'll tell you what. Let's uh, start, on the, start on the next one, and then we'll get through at least most of it or part of it, and then we'll take a, then we'll take a short break, yeah. and we'll come back and give our thoughts and, and things. Like I said, this is an interesting enough uh one we're gonna do two on on this one and kind of split it up keep it keep it a little shorter we've been trying to keep the episodes a little shorter it, it hasn't worked so far <laughs> uh i mean we kept it shorter compared to the very first episodes because a lot of those were like an hour and a half two oh, hours totally uh, but uh and a lot of those that were two hours we cut down but we're gonna try and truncate things so yeah. all right so this one is an interesting article that i stumbled across called a vision of the future by Stuart Robertson. In the 1966 Elvis special, I had an article published in which I 
hit out at the critics who slam Elvis and his fans unfairly, and I listed several points to support my views. The proof of any pudding, however, is in the eating. So let us see if I am right. Way back then I said, one, Elvis is supreme over all the pop music field. Two, the groups are beginning to fade. Three, 11 out of 13 Elvis films were excellent. Four, the Beatles will be finished before 1968. And five, Almost right. Elvis records constantly, Elvis records constantly hit the charts. Yeah, he was only off on the Beatles by two years. Two years. And they weren't finished because people lost interest, but because they lost interest. Exactly. <laughs> well, somebody did. Yeah. <laughs> five strong points. No offense to the Beatles fans out there. I'm just kidding around. Which any non-Elvis fan would deny in a second. But uh, which, which any non-Elvis fan would deny in a second. But let us tackle them all fairly one by one. First, Elvis is still supreme over the world of the, mu of the over the world music scene. Right or wrong? I believe yes. Why? Well, just take a look at the top tens of some foreign countries, and you'll find an Elvis record. He's always there in Hong Kong, Germany, Denmark, Poland, the USA, and the Philippines, to name only a few. Elvis discs like I'm Yours, Love Letters, Puppet on a String, and Easy Question were fantastic international successes. And Hound Dog even entered the top ten in Japan. What about the Beatles, you'll ask? I'll deal with that along with point four. <laughs> Who else is there? Cliff? Not really. He is still to equal Elvis's success in America, which dominates the world scene. The Stones? Let's see how they get last in comparison with Elvis. Chubby Checker was once proposed. No further comment needed. Ouch! <laughs> the plain truth is that in the, him, I like Chubby Checker. <laughs> in the world, there is no single artiste near the greatness of the king, nor do I see that there likely is to be one for years to come. Are the groups fading? Yes! In the summer of 1964, you could count as many as 15 British groups in the top 30. Nowadays, there's barely half that number, and all of them belong to a the small, ever-changing clique of groups who are fairly consistent for a time. Then they fade away. Witness Dave Clark of Elvis's finished fame. Also, Billy J. Kramer, Moody Blues, them, and you'll be able to think of lots more. Many new groups would be nothing without their gimmicks, e.g. Dave D., The Who, Trogs, and others. Many other groups suffer from international changes, e.g. the animals, the yard birds, which usually results in a fall of popularity. One thing about Elvis, he has never resorted to a gimmick record for a hit. I noted that the Stones might be able to challenge Elvis internationally. One or two of their releases have been comparative flops, and how such poor material as 19th Nervous Breakdown made the top beats me. I like that song. <laughs> <laughs> I think the moment of truth has come, and not before a time. The Americans are now in as, as strong a position as they were in 1963, and the beat boom is dead. Elvis is still around as I write this. <laughs> Should we take a little break? Yeah, I think we'll, uh, we'll uh, close up just for now. We're going to continue with this article. It's really, really cool. We're going to keep looking at the Elvis special, 1968, after these messages. All right, we are back looking at the Elvis special 1968, and uh, this is really, really cool. So it's <laughs> fascinating some of the opinions on this. All right. So uh, as I was finishing up before the break, we were reading Stuart Roberts and um, taking shots at the Rolling Stones' 19th Nervous Breakdown, right. which is a record I quite like, but right. he apparently did not. Um, let's uh, continue here. Let's get back to Elvis and his films. In 1965, I said that 11 out of 13 of his films were good. I na now say 17 out of 21. The four of which were complete flops to my mind were World's Fair, Wild in the Country, Harem Holiday, and Paradise Hawaiian Style. Okay, I can't fault too much of that. He hasn't acted well since Kissin' Cousins, except in Tickle Me, nor has he been outstanding in any film since Follow That Dream. Even Frankie and Johnny came as a bit of a letdown, although the soundtrack was excellent. At least, it was the best since Fun in Acapulco. That's, oh. 
Okay. No Viva Love. <laughs> right. Uh, so this is uh, partly compensated for by the low standard of acting. Paradise Hawaiian style invited comparison with Blue Hawaii, and that was a pale shadow, If it, uh, and what a pale shadow it was of the earlier picture. Apart from the record company issuing an LP with at least 10 to 15 minutes playing time missing, only sandcastles reached the standard of songs like No More, Can't Help Falling in Love, and Hawaiian Wedding Song. And yet, this number isn't even heard in the film. I agree with that. Well, the, the, the sandcastles being good part. I, yeah. The sooner harem holiday is forgotten, the better. <laughs> I was really shocked that Elvis should be in such a poor film. As usual, we fans got short-tracked, uh, got a short-tracked album featuring one good song only. So close yet so far. <laughs> My fourth point is bold, but since I wrote that, a Beatles record, Yellow Submarine, has failed to reach the top in America. Their own fans protest at their open disregard of the country that made them, and their outspoken views have turned many against them. (laughs) Small points, you might say, but the shortest fires are the fiercest. The Beatles have achieved many great things, but now they may be grinding slowly but surely to an, and inevitably to a halt. Let's just wait and see, shall we? Hey, what actually kind of wasn't wrong, You're but right. not for the reasons he thought. Not for the reasons he thought. Of course, Elvis's records hit the charts, but they don't really need to any longer because true Elvis fa- oh, Elvis fans oh, Elvis records hit the charts, but they don't really need to any longer because true Elvis fans don't care whether any of his latest records makes number 19 or 21. Who cares? I certainly don't. Since 1963, Elvis has had only four top ten hits, namely Kissin' Cousins, Cryin' in the Chapel, How I Watched the Critics' Faces Turn Red, The Beautiful Love Letters, and lastly, If Every Day Was Like Christmas. In the same time, he's had several near top 20 scrapes with Such a Night, Blue Christmas, Do the Clam, Tell Me Why, Blue River, Frankie and Johnny, and All That I Am. But this is now acceptable. The point to note is that there are still enough fans to put his records in the charts, and we fans should be proud of this feat. Since his golden flop, One Broken Heart for Sale, there have been no less than 16 Elvis records in the British hit parade, and nearly all of them have been gold disc. Elvis has achieved disc-wise and sales-wise since 1963 more than than most artistes do all their days. No film soundtracks are usually as excellent as Elvis's, e.g. Frankie and Johnny, Girl Happy, and Kissin' Cousins, although bad eggs like Harem Holiday come along once in a while. (laughs) I have no doubt that if Love Letters, All That I Am, and If Every Day Like Christmas are a foretaste of 1968, all I can say is, roll on and let the critics rot. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that's marvelous. Uh, It's fascinating to think about what fans were thinking just before the 68 comeback hit. Right. You can you can feel a little bit of weariness in that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This guy, he's interacting with fans of other artists. Yeah. He's getting a little flack from him because Elvis, you know, hasn't been as dominant in the record industry as he had the first eight years of his career. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they're... they're trying their best to hold down the fort. Yeah. But help was on the way, and they were not even aware yet. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. the uh, <laughs> That's pretty cool. The Well, and then, I mean, they started, but they talk about things that would we would come to know as the start of those things. Right, exactly. Like, uh, love letters and, you know, being part of the 1966 uh, How Great Their Art sessions. Exactly. But, man, just... That's that's wild. It is an interest. It's interesting to see, like, uh, you know, it's, it's this is a time that I've never really thought about being an Elvis fan in before, right? And hearing this, uh, it, it gives me a lot of empathy for some of the older fans and their views on that era of Elvis. Yeah, that we we maybe feel they are a little harsh about, but we we can get a better idea of why they came to the opinions they did. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, and you know, like. Zeitgeists are not nearly the thing now, right? Like, especially for, especially in the last, I would say, especially in the last fifteen years, particularly, 
the whole notion of of uh, zeitgeists in music yeah there's there are artists who have built followings and maintained followings but there's not this is the moment of this of uh, for a, a genre or for something like that to where you get people that oh that's new oh that's old or that's whatever you know that that kind of thing is really going away right uh i mean you see pockets of it but sure. it's it's not it's not this sort of seemingly all encompassing thing sure it's like you think of the 90s and like the the boy bands and there's like 20 of them there's like you know there's like in sync and 98 degrees and all this kind of you know you think about that where you know and then in the 60s you know the beatles and the beards and the whoever <laughs> no. uh you know you see like uh you know the beatles the monkeys and all you know this kind of stuff um then of course you know in the the 50s early 60s you've got like you know well elvis who then who spawned like a whole host of uh, what what the what the other magazine or what the other book called also rans, yeah. and uh, some of whom are still recording today. Um, it's it's really interesting to see those things, especially for fans who know more of a modern context. Where, right. yeah, people get on each other for certain things, but for the most part, everybody just kind of likes what they like. Right, and you know, there's the musical snobbery is um is often is somewhat somewhat socially driven um but it's not it's not this it's not this giant thing right. anymore the way it was and so to to have that sort of context uh and to feel that sort of context in the defense side yeah yeah you, you totally you get you get a little different perspective on it yeah, exactly. I mean, I think, you know, we now kind of acknowledge that the Hollywood era sort of like like Baz Luhrmann shows in his film, it sort yeah. of removed him from like you said the zeitgeist of everything that was going on. Yeah. He was in this bubble, this gilded bubble, right? Yeah. And he was just about to burst out, but these fans had no idea. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but man, it's just Again, it's it's really cool, and that's one of the things that we that I, I I really enjoy. I know you really enjoy that we like presenting on the channel is like differing viewpoints and and our responses to those viewpoints too. You know, positive, negative, whatever. Um, you see these things, and it makes you think about them differently. Particularly who fans who from fans who weren't there, uh, you get to say, oh, okay, this is this is kind of like what what people were what some people were thinking, and this. Obviously, it's not everybody. You get differing perspective. Dad talks about what it, it's Elvis. We just we loved it. It was Elvis. That was it. You know? Right. It's like I I do think it's fascinating. In the U.S., you hear about all the controversy, and there certainly was a lot of controversy, especially you know in the fifties, and yet you know when Elvis hit Iowa, uh, well when Elvis music hit Iowa. It was just kind of everyone just like, well, at least in his circles, were just like, yeah, this is great, you know. I, I'm, you know, oh yeah, my parents were cool with it. They watched the shows with. I'm like, that's different, right? Exactly. You know, versus, uh, you know, versus people that are m maybe in a little like larger areas, you know. Man, I I imagine being an Elvis fan in 1965 and 66 before the How Great Thou Art sessions would have been the hardest time to be a fan. Mm -hmm. Because not only was he like hardly going into the studio, and not only were you having to suffer through uh, Harem Holiday or, or Harem Scarum and Paradise Hawaiian style, yeah. but this is while like the Beatles and the Stones were doing some of their best stuff. Yeah. Well, and, and I want to kind of put some of what you're saying in perspective because it's a little... Um it's a little bit different. Like when we say that we're not, it's not really so much a judgment on the material as much as you might think. It's more of the case of if you're looking at this and it seems like that is the whole future of Elvis. Right. As opposed to like, now we can look at that stuff and we look at it in its context and we see it kind of for what it is and we can more appreciate it for what it is because he didn't just spend the rest of his life making like, 
harem scarum sequels or whatever. Right. If you thought that was what the future had in store, these low budget yeah. drive in movies where he looks pained to finish them right often yeah yeah yeah. well you know the beatles are like about to release rubber soul yeah and the rolling stones are doing their thing like yeah you would have you would have thought man come on right show me something here elvis <laughs> right 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 you know <laughs> don't leave me empty-handed bud <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean you know because you know being his fan growing up and just having elvis on tour and then turning around and watching spin out and then all this kind of it just it just kind of all is right but then to have this perspective and go you know just they didn't know like they just how you know how do you how do you grasp how do you grapple with that so you you know you see some of the resentment you understand some of the resentment and some of the defensiveness defensiveness at the time and i think at least partially resentment in retrospect it must have seemed like you know to have this guy who is the leader of a youth rebellion making these basically family movies yeah it must have been like watching James Dean turn into Fred McMurray. <laughs> you know? Like it must have felt kind of like that. You right, know? exactly. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, we've got a little, a few more thoughts to give on the Elvis special 1968, and we will give those after these messages. All right, we are back for our closing segment of looking at the Elvis special, 1968. And I I don't care what anybody says. I love Spin Out. That's freaking awesome. Oh, it's a, it's a fun movie. He, I like he it He looks lot. awesome, and it's just, it's just fun. But, uh, yeah. But we can appreciate this without the anxiety of knowing that, you know, there would be, without wondering if there would be more great stuff afterwards. Yeah. yeah. It's easier to... It's easier to appreciate the journey when you know how it goes. Exactly. And when and so hearing perspectives from time from a time when they didn't know that. Yeah. Endlessly it, it just incredibly interesting. fascinating. Yeah. Yep. I fascinating, agree. interesting, just uh yeah. The uh I know we have a fair number of uh UK watchers of the channel. First off, uh, apologies. I do don't do not mean to offend anybody with the sort of. Uh, I, I, it's not really a British accent that I'm doing with when I read some of these things. Uh, just I didn't. I don't know. I just, I just pick a voice that strikes me. So I don't mean any disrespect. And if any if somebody's like stop that, then I you know I will because uh, I don't mean any disrespect to anybody. Uh, if we, someone's like stop that, jokes on you. We film these ahead of time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, true. Um, but uh, we are not quite done looking at this, but uh, we are going to basically leave it there for now. Uh, but uh, there are some really neat things. I have to say, that drawing, it I guess it's supposed to be Elvis. It's in in uh, in like later, but like the outfit is very love me tender. Yeah, it but looks, the, uh, the hair tender. is very girl happy. It's a composite drawing. It is. Interesting. Yep. So it, it is, uh, this is, uh, hey, baby, let's rock it in art form. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. But, uh, yeah, we had a lot of fun watching that or listen, listening to, I had a lot of fun watching John listen to that. <laughs> that was, uh, that was best, basically the best way to go. Yeah. So in the next episode, we will show you another, uh, couple of articles from special 1968, including a description of Graceland, including the upstairs from the mid sixties. That's going to be cool. I am looking forward to that. Yeah. Yeah. So, I'm curious. Yeah. So did you get the Elvis special 1968? What was your favorite part of it? Uh, what was your feeling as an Elvis fan at the time? Share, uh, you know, share your experiences, um, you know, and for, for those like the people that share those experiences, they're given their thoughts at the time. So everybody else in the comments treat each other with love and respect because that's their feeling at the time. And uh, some people still harbor some of those uh, feelings and things on some of the material now. But I just want to say, give everybody their space to, to love what they love and the way that they love it. Because, uh, you know, don't, uh, don't get on each other. Uh, and you all have been beautiful in that regard. You haven't been. I just like to give, 
I just like to give reminders on that, especially when we get into things that are potentially more contentious, like the feelings of fans at the time in this period particularly. Oh, sure. Yeah. If there was any time to uh, feel under siege as an Elvis fan, this would have been the time. This would have been the time, for sure. But uh, anyway, this is our look at Elvis Special 1968. We are going to look some more at this in the next episode. I uh, hope you've enjoyed this. Uh, until the next time, I'm Jamie. And I'm John. And this is the Elvis Archival Preservation Society. The whole point of the EAP Society is to make sure that Elvis history is not lost to history. Beautiful pieces of history like this. We really appreciate all of these neat perspectives and pieces. Uh, the whole idea, like I said, n letting no point of Elvis history be lost to history, including some of the viewpoints points and things in here every bit of information all these different things that we can get a hold of that we can share with everybody uh, we want to share different perspectives bits of history different different viewpoints not only that they have but that we have in our re reactions to those different pieces uh, i think that that's really nice for the learning process so we can all learn together as fans and so that way uh, elvis and information and these perspectives are available and there for current generations and future generations of Elvis fans uh, for everybody, no matter what your budget level is, because Elvis was, acce was accessible to everybody, and we like to continue that and pay it forward as best we can. So this is not just a YouTube channel. The EAP Society is also a movement, and it's people-powered. That means you. Uh, like, share, comment on the video, subscribe to the channel if you have not already. When we hit 20,000 subscribers, we're going to give away this Elvis-owned item from 1956. He had it until the mid-70s, and somebody is going to win this when we hit 20,000 subscribers, so really looking forward to that. We have an Elvis Presley autograph we're going to give away. We have FTDs to give away, all kinds of really cool stuff because we want to grow the channel and do, like, the stuff that you're seeing now is, like, Tinker Toys in the kiddie pool compared to what where we want to go with the channel and what we want to do for the Elvis fandom. Uh, we have a lot of big plans. So everything that you can do, the more folks we have here watching and everything, is helps to make all of that happen more and more and more. And we appreciate every last one of you. If you want to get in on the ground floor even more, go to EAPsociety.com and click on become a member to become the member of the Elvis Archival Preservation Society. We love all of our members. Uh, you select a tier that you would like. You get all kinds of neat, neat stuff. You get ad-free videos, early videos, extended videos, exclusive content, bonus stuff, all kinds of neat, nifty things. Uh, and uh, we are always looking for cool things for our members that they will find interesting and enjoyable uh, as a database of interesting and new Elvis information that we uncover. And that's always a lot of fun. Uh, like I said, members get in on the ground floor. We appreciate all of our members and especially our very own Colonel, Colonel Miles Foreman. Thank you, Colonel. All right. Well, we put out videos every Tuesday for Quick Take Tuesday and on Friday as our main channel content. We thank you all for being here. We love you all. And until the next video, be good to yourselves. Be good to each other. And always, TCB. My society, my society, here with all the friends I want to see. Don't need no high society to get me where I want to be. My society, yeah, that's for me. Oh, my society, yeah, that's for me. Oh, my society.